you take my hand? What's this then? Take my hand. Will you take my hand? I look into her eyes. See everything clear now. Stars whisper down from the skies. Everything's clear now. This is. G'day, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigal Elder. For my first song, nah, only kidding you fellas. But first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge our Aboriginal Elders, all Elders, past and present, and pay my respects to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters, from whatever Aboriginal or Island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal and to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. Only three things sure than that, coming, taxation and going. Where we are today is Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own. The Hawkesbury River to the north, Nepean to the west and George's River to the south. And in between those three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation. And in that nation, there are 29 clans, and the clans land we're on today is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the City of Sydney and the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this UTS Big Thinking event for Sydney Festival 2021, The Art of Nature. I'm Professor Larissa Berendt, a member of the Sydney Festival Board and the UTS Council and host of Speaking Out on ABC Radio and it's an honour to be facilitating this event. I'd like to begin by acknowledging country and as I pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, I ask that you in your own way acknowledge the country that you're on. So let us pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging who are the custodians of knowledge and who generously share this land with us. The acknowledgement to country is particularly important today as we discuss the challenges of bushfires, climate change, population pandemic and our role in addressing these issues. Can artists shape the way we think about the environment? As our anxiety grows over the effects of climate change on our world, what role can creative practitioners play in the transformation of our attitudes and behaviour? As the global pandemic reshapes our lives, artists remain poised to play a key role in the communication of difficult, complex ideas. And we have three leading creative intellects with us to give their in insights and perspectives on this topic. Janet Lawrence is a Sydney-based artist who works across installation, photography, sculpture and video. She explores the interconnectedness of living things through her practice and she is the curator of the Sydney Festival event Requiem. Jason DeSantelo is a lawyer and an expert on Indigenous methodology and ethics. He's a filmmaker and associate professor of, at the De Faculty of Design, Architecture and Building at UTS. And Jane Sheldon is an American-Australian soprano and composer who specialises in the creation and performance of exploratory chamber music. She is the creator of and performs in the Sydney Festival event, Poem for a Dried Up River. So thank you all for being with me today. And I thought we'd start by getting a clearer sense of your worldview and perspective. So I'm going to ask each of you how you see your relationship with the, with country and land and what's shaped that understanding for you and how that's come through in your creative practice. And I'll start with you, Jason. Oh, thanks, Larissa. It's, it's really, really nice to be here on Gadigal Country and um, at UTS where, where we work and have done so much, so much good things um, uh, here. 
Um, you know, my, my tribes are Gadawa and Baringham, so um, that's southwest Gulf country of the Northern Territory. Borolula is the, is the township there and um, southeast Queensland. Um, but I have a really strong connection. I was born in Darwin, um, have a really strong connection with the territory and have, have spent a lot of time reconnecting uh, with my family and, and my community and um, over, over, over a good 25 years, I guess. And, um, but it's quite, uh, you know, I have a quite a complex relationship to country, I, th I think. I've moved around a lot um, and um, in particular lived on the East Coast. So, um, and I have a young family now and, and so in, in pandemic and the challenges that we've all gone through um, living through this and continuing to live through this, the ideas of isolation, have really impacted on the way that we can, we can maintain connections in, in particular my family and we haven't been able to go up to the territory and we haven't been able to, um, to see mob that usually come down, our elders and, um, um, and cultural leaders. So what happens when, when, when those, those things come into effect? Um, for us, it's been just connecting, you know, going back to the old school technology, you know, the, the phone. I've been on the phone every day, pretty much, <laughs> chatting with everyone and really um, trying to stay connected and in touch with, with, with the family that's living at the front line um, on our homelands, continuing those custodial roles. Um, and, I, and I think it's a really exciting time, and particularly in, in the field I'm in now, in design and using creative practice as a way to maintain those connections and as a way to enact, so, you know, like we have the most beautiful, sophisticated systems of law and practices for maintaining relationships and healthy country. So those are all unchanging, but what happens about all the relationships? How do you maintain those relationships and how do you show respect to that? And I think, you know, art in particular um, has been that has, has, has been able to hold that vibrancy for me in particular. Um, and, you know, dabbling in film um, has been a way for me to work as, in my role as, as, as a custodian, um, working with, with communities up, up home. Um, but here, you know, our, you know, my children have learnt, are learning to tread softly. And I think, I think there's something in that, that notion of treading softly on country and being respectful with the way you conduct yourself. Um, and it's just been an amazing time to see these uprisings, you know, climate justice, you know, school strike for climate, 80,000 people, you know, mostly young people standing up to, to saying that enough is enough. And then we saw the Black Lives Matter, 80, you know, 50,000 people on the street saying, you know, that what's, you know, we need to get, you know, we need to really challenge white supremacy, we really need to challenge the way policies are dividing us. And um, in that way, I think it's a, just a really interesting time alongside, you know, you can, what, what we're seeing, I think, is the impact on country. So the bushfires is a, is a, is a, is a really strong indication of how we're not looking after country. Um, and I, I really believe that um, right now and the role that we have is, as um, practitioners or intellectuals or whatever role we take, whether we're an ally or an accomplice, a witness or hard out on the front line, we're all really, you know, it's a time to unite and um, really, really step up and face the challenges for future generations. Um, yeah, so. I want to pick up on a couple of those themes later on, but just before I move on, I wondered if you could also just talk a little bit about how that worldviews shaped your methodology because I mentioned in the introduction that actually ethical practice, protocols, methodologies are areas that you've kind of led the way in. I just wondered if you could say a little bit about why that's been such a focus for you. Yeah, um, I mean a really good example is when I went back to my community as a young fella and um, I thought I was really, I was in the middle of my law degree, I thought I was really cool, I had dreads and I wore Birkenstocks and stuff like that. And like, you know, and, and really I went back and, and I, I thought I knew um, ways forward um, by studying law and rights frameworks and all that kind of stuff. But um, the elders were really quick to, to start to teach me about the importance of some of the old ways. And, um, and that, in a way, that was part of my decolonizing journey. It's a very personal journey of learning my language and going through ceremony and 
um, being really committed to um, listening, you know, listening and having 3,000 cups of teas. And in that way, it became, the methodology became something that I, I embodied. Um, and, you know, some of the work, you know, your work, you know, in, in terms of story work is law. Um, Joanne Archibald's, you know, work in um, heart, mind, body and spirit. The idea of indigenous story work um, as methodology. Um, Romaine Morton's beautiful work and, you know, the right to dream and being embodied as a sovereign Aboriginal woman. You know, these are some of the things that we need that have sort of influenced my, my practice, I guess. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really exciting area and I um, hope to do, to do more of that as a collective rather than an individual, I guess. It's interesting that the, it's as much about the process as it is about the end product, I guess, was what I was trying to draw out, which I <laughs> yeah, think is yeah. a fascinating thing. Yeah, and what about you, Janet? Well, I also would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and thank them for having me on their land and also to ask their guidance into um, my future here and all our futures here. We need them so much now. And I've, I guess I've, I've had a very different sort of um, way of um, coming into country. I've spent most of my life um, as a young child even a very intimate connection with what I might call nature and wanting to feel a, a, my interconnection with it and uh, it led me into all sorts of ex explorations and ways of being in it as, as children do. But at the same time, I had the experience of um, the colonisation of this place in big country um, properties and I felt then the discordancy of these big, you know, white graziers um, not loving the land. It was a, a watching them and observing this terrible battled existence and feeling how wrong it was and seeing through droughts the agony of animals and it affected me very, very deeply to the point where I went and lived in the country in Italy. <laughs> where I felt a, con a kind of I could connect into those mythical connections to land and after years of that it made me long to come back to Australia and find that here and I knew that the only way through it was and into it was um, in di through indigenous knowledge and and entering into understanding some of that and at the same time I explored um, by this time I'm ex wanting to explore through my art um, a process of, of entering it and, and using uh, um, that sort of experiment as artwork, as it were. And I mean, I, I don't really, I think it's an ongoing process. I think I'm kind of always um, taking on new things. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it's me trying to enter understand and um, ask for the, the, the knowledge of elders to, to help me um, is the huge factors of climate change that are happening that I'm witnessing um, this nature of ours so, so fragile and so threatened and so I feel as an artist my um, mission or my what drives me very much is to try and speak about this to try and um, bring attention to this incredible fragility and the importance of how how can we learn to love this land those of us I mean who you know those from colonization it wasn't loved in this way and I feel it's just such a devastating chasm and and I suppose I <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm there witnessing that side and so I, so really, my, my really, in my art, I'm trying to bring us into this interconnection, to recognise this interconnection, to recognise the wonder of this place, the incredible wonder of it and to, um, to and, and its fragility. So I've sort of developed a language really of of care and aesthetics of care, of how, you know, that we're, now we need to heal now and, 
and of course what I realise is that we need all our in, Indigenous elders to help us or Indigenous peoples and stories and ways into it to understand how to make this land sacred for all of us because I think um, our way forward here in Australia is totally dependent on that love of this land. Lovely, thank you. And what about you, Jane? As an American Australian, it already sounds like you've got um, an affiliation with more than one place, so. Yes, um, although I've recently sort of undergone quite a deep transformation of my sense of place and um, I mean what what I'll say about this would be such a no-brainer to anyone in a community that's been in place for years or generations or millennia but for me it's quite recent um, and you know for years I was traveling constantly uh, and when I wasn't traveling I was living in an apartment in Manhattan and you know I love New York but Nothing about my lifestyle nourished the kind of um, connection to place that I think you're really asking about. Um, but then a couple of years ago, I um, moved my sort of primary location back to Australia to the Blue Mountains, to Gundungara country, and really underwent quite a deep transformation of a particular kind. Um, that I think was about, I also reduced my travel a lot and so I really committed to sort of being in place. And the specific thing that I came to understand was that, <clears throat> pardon me, it's one thing to care in the abstract about place and that's very important of course, um, but then there's this, it's another thing to come to embody or start to embody that care through this basically involuntary heightening of the senses that seems to happen when you stay in place. And um, this was all very much deepened by the 2019 drought and the experience with the summer bushfires last year, um, where, you know, my grief and heartbreak was really twofold, where, um, you know, I felt the heartbreak registered um, via sort of an abstract understanding of things like the just stunning number of wildlife killed. But then it also, that was underscored by um, this much more bodily and intuitive registration of heartbreak um, that came from, for example, like hearing a whipbird pair in my front garden and knowing that something is horribly wrong because they should not be there. They live in wet forests and they're never on this dry ridge. and you know, that particular kind of understanding, like you can't fake it or force it, you just have to be there long enough to understand what's happening. Um, and I'm very moved by, by this growing understanding and um, think it has to be a good thing. Did you want to say, I mean, obviously that sounds like a quite profound transformation in terms of your sense of place and identity. Just wondering how that's come through in your creative practice. Well, I think it's so nascent that um, the evidence of it might be yet to show up um, in a way that can be sort of read, um, not just by other people, but even by me. Um, but, you know, a refrain that recurs in my work, especially recently, is um, a kind of conflation or confusion of the body with the landscape. Um, and there must, that this must be affected um, by this recent thinking. Um, but as you can tell, I'm really not yet articulate about um, exactly where in my process that effect is being had. I love that it's such a great reminder that much of our creativity comes from uh, instinct and emotion rather than that we intellectualise it first and then produce it. So. Um, we'll come back to deconstructing your work a little bit sure. more in, in a minute. But, um, Janet, it's probably a, a good moment to talk to you about your event and installation, Requiem, which speaks to a lot of the themes that you spoke about when you were introducing your worldview. And it's um, got uh, visual art, it's got poetry, performance, science, philosophy, environmental advocacy, and a, a huge nod to Indigenous knowledges as well. Um, 
There are lots of ideas and thematics to unpack in Requiem and it's a very timely and thought-provoking work. So I was wondering if we could just start by what were some of the impetuses or inspirations for the work itself? Well, you know, having sort of said how deeply um, I feel connected to um, nature around me and place and, and certain places in particular. Um, the bushfires were for me, for everyone, completely devastating and I felt the most shocking grief um, that was so, so um, terrifying about how can we deal with this and how can we possibly reckon it and understand it. So it was overwhelming grief but also anger of knowing that this didn't need to happen. And all of the things that I felt that we need for living on land here had, you know, were the reason it, it happened because nothing had been adhered to in the way um, it could have been and should and one hopes. But, but I, so it was, was this, you know, grief. And the other thing happened is that we were kind of mourning. And for me, the loss of the animals and plants was overwhelming. And I couldn't stop um, uh, accounting, looking at that. And I, um, I just thought, we, we really need to mourn. And then suddenly COVID came and suddenly we were like, we were snapped out of any possibility of doing it. And before COVID came, I remember thinking, I want to have a requiem for all these plants and animals. And um, then, you know, this happened. And then I realised that this had to be a very broad way of embracing it. And I, I talked to Sydney Environment Institute about teaming up so they could do panels that included, you know, much more a reckoning about it, and to Groundswell, who also could organise panels, um, so that we could broaden it right out. And, and so really it is, it does encompass all these things because I, I thought of it very much of, I need this particular space, which I'd worked in before, which is the Paddington Reservoir, which I do think of as like a sort of huge, almost sacred space. I, I feel I want to make it that. And um, I kept imagining how it could be and how it could feel in there and that anyone could come in and, you know, have their own lament. And in fact, I'm allowing that to happen in quite spontaneously. Some people are going to come in, maybe just sing or do something in the space. Um, but the program, of course, adheres to very much um, trying to deal with this um, questioning the bushfires, but also um, the possibility of moving on, but also the, the accounting for these, this massive loss. And so um, each, like the poets will do it in their way and the, and the um, musicians will do it in theirs. And so it does make it this much, much broader thing to have. And there are artworks in there and everything I've curated has been very, very specifically to deal with this aspect of a sort of lament for the loss in the bushfire. And can you tell us, a little, I know it's a bit of a work in progress yeah. with the challenges of COVID and the ongoing mm. uh, shifting situation, but can you perhaps talk a little bit more about some of the, the highlights for you about mm. who's included? And I mean, it's a huge program, so yeah. there's lots to choose from. I know it is. It's it's really um, um, it's it's very very comprehensive. Um, well, I have um, uh, uh, William and Veronique um, doing. Uh, they're being presented by Artology, so they've and they've been commissioned to do a new work that is specifically about the about the fires, and uh, they were and they're performing there twice. And there, um, there's also a cellist performing between the Christina Christinason, who's composed the special work about um, trees and loss of trees between all the poets. But there's also, um, I've got my water bar there again, but it's this time showing all the waters and how damaged they are and states of water. But I've got Uncle Bruce Shillingsworth who will activate the water bar and talk about the waters. And then Groundswell have got some um, fantastic 
um, speakers and Lil Madden's doing a children's workshop, which with COVID is now becoming a storytelling event. And so a lot of the events are changing and the Sydney Environment Institute panels, there's little shifts happening between that. Um, I've also got the film I've borrowed from Northern Pictures about um, wild after the bushfires and I've made another, a film which will be on a loop in there and then there's some wonderful artists work who deal very specifically with ash and fire, uh, Jutz Kitson and Yasmin Smith and amongst others so it's, um, it's very comprehensive and <laughs> you know I, I just think um, things uh, will interplay and evolve as we go along. We've also got Red Rebels will do a little dead pose at, out the front and Tree Veneration Society, or other things will be happening in the park as well. So it creates this whole atmosphere for the place. And what do you, I mean, it is, it is a big program. It's very interactive in a way and it's yes. very provocative. What are you hoping audiences will take from it? I want them to be brought into um, the fact that this was a major, major, huge, big sadness, sorrow for us all in Australia to understand that, that it really is. Um, and, and for them to have the opportunity to acknowledge that and hopefully to create the, the possibility of them reckoning and understanding that we really need to um, look after this land and a lot of the talks we'll be talking about that like we've got fire sticks talking about you know cultural burning and the eff and we know of course if <laughs> the effects of that and how we should be doing it so um, I'm hoping that the audience really can embrace that because it's also a slow space it's not like you know quick look and it won't be that sort of space and so hopefully that gives people the opportunity to really engage but also in enable people to mourn yes nice. yeah. jason um i want to pick up on something that you mentioned early on about the bushfires and it seems fitting since janet's just mentioned fire sticks who mm -hmm. you've been a great supporter and have interacted with a lot just wanted to get your observations about what it was like when, and your thoughts when the bushfires were raging this time last year. As Janet says, it seems like a lifetime ago, but in many ways for people living on country, that's still very, very raw. And uh, particularly given your understanding and involvement with traditional fire burning. Yeah, um, yeah that, that moment was really significant and I can really, I really do feel um, going slow, with the mourning process is so important mm. for all of us. Mm. And um, acknowledging that space is incredibly important in terms of dealing with the emotional resonance of, of country. And I, I do remember we went to a really important rally around climate justice and Auntie Rhonda Dixon Grosvenor was there, local, amazing local elder, Nadina Dixon, her daughter, and Victor Stephenson, who's a really, really yeah. good brother of mine. And um, the fires were still going, and um, Arnie did an amazing welcome and a really strong saying, you know, we really need to look at it holistically. So it's not just about the fire itself, it's actually the waterways and the way we, we look after country. And we need those, we need the ability to take control of that space again um, and use our practices because everyone doesn't know that cultural burning is the absolute key to looking after the landscape in Australia. Everyone doesn't know. No. The Royal Commission doesn't know. They just did a Royal Commission oh. into the bushfires and none of the recommendations said that we need to really resource this. Um, whereas Fire Sticks has shown such a, such a leadership oh. and is creating a, you know, a, a national network of young cultural burners on their own country. Um, and Victor, you know, really importantly with his amazing book, Fire Country, and his gener generosity and leadership in this space um, he's at this rally and, and there's a lot of young people and the smoke's going across and he, he looks up and he goes, you know, this is, this is particles of animals. You know, this is particles of animals that we're breathing in. Um, and you could really feel people understand that we are connected to the land. And, um, and it was a moment for me as well, knowing that up home we still, um, the management of fire is still trapped institutionally. 
So we're still chucking incendiary bombs out of, and it's, it's not the way, way forward, but they're doing it in that way because the resources are not there. And um, I really feel that um, part of our role, hopefully, in, in, the, in the research space and in partnership and on invitation from communities, um, we can really make a difference and really start shifting, shifting policy. Um, and just finally, I, I did ring Uncle Max Dormunman Harrison, who I've, I've grown, um, just, just afterwards. It was, a, it, was, it was straight after, and it was just really devastating to hear an elder of such high significance. Um, just really incredibly sad and, um, you know, a bit, you know, just un unlike him, you know, he's an 80 year old, he's just so fit and amazing and so generous. Um, and it was just really hard to, to know, and I don't want to talk about you and country, but, you know, um, it's not my place to talk about that country, but I know that areas around Australia that have been managed by fire sticks over a number of years prior to the bushfires, the, the fires just went around these places. Um, the evidence is there. And um, I hope that um, as a community, we can really unite around and support you know, local, local community initiatives that fire sticks and other tribes and nations are, are pushing forward with and have always been pushing forward. Yeah. Speaking of the local, um, your um, own uh, activism, advocacy, storytelling has um, unsurprisingly focused a lot on your traditional country. Um, mm. And I was wondering if you could talk to us from that perspective about the myriad of issues facing a community like Barralula, because it gives mm. us a good snapshot of, of what a place like that is, is looking at in terms of the complexity of climate change. Yeah, I mean, I feel um, like it was really quite surprising, not surprising, but when COVID hit, the community strength comes, th comes through. Like, um, Gadrian, you know, my bro, Gadrian Hooson and Brucey King and others up there and Nicholas Fitzpatrick and Scott McDini and all these young leaders that are coming through, they were like, we're going to, if the government doesn't close the road, we're going to close the road. Um, and so, like, I think in moments of where you see, the, you know, the democratic institution of governance not working, our old ways are still present and we have the authority to conduct ourselves in ways that will look after the well-being of everyone. So I think the issues at play um, are sparking massive resurgences, cultural resurgences all around the world, just like Moana Kea and Iomatau and all these, these massive resurgences happening where communities are uniting and saying, no, this is, this is, this is, a, new, this is a new time for us. Um, but, you know, obviously the impacts of the MacArthur River mine, you know, Glencore's MacArthur River mine has just absolutely poisoned the waterways, the main river system there. Um, so we're dealing with the main issues that I see humbly offered from my perspective. I don't live there. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's around water. The basic things, water, being the right to drink clean water from your own lands and to hunt and fish on your own lands, simple simple things. Um, food, the idea of food sovereignty and being having the access to, to um, clean water means that you can have, hunt and live off your own lands. Um, and then also the, the, the real, um, the tragedy of, of a lot of um, the education system has meant that um, there's, you know, the languages are in real jeopardy and the languages are key to the knowledge systems. Um, so I think you know, a combination of those things coupled with the absolutely, you know, the absolute devastating state violence that we have, you know, two years ago, 100% um, of Don Dale was black. Black kids are in jail um, from a very young age, you know. Um, all of my nephews have been now, I've been to Don Dale um, before they did the review. Um, and it's literally a, a tin shed with a couple of, you know, like you go into the thing, it's just a tin shed in the tropics. You know, this is like, this is, this is, and the United Nations has called out the Australian government over and over again with the state violence. So I think, you know, we're seeing, you know, the over 440 black deaths in custody. This is continuing to happen and, um, you know, there's something wrong with the story we're telling about Australia. And there's something wrong that 
about the story that we're telling ourselves about Australia. You know, Australia is not a cool place to live if you're black. You know, I'm okay, I'm fair, you know, I've got fair skin. But, um, you know, like, if you're black and you live in this country, you are in, you are, it's, 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 it can be a very dangerous place. So I think those kind of things, um, when you add them all together, and you add climate change and, you know, the change in the seasons and, the, you know, the hunting seasons are changing and it becomes a very, very um, difficult space to navigate looking, you know, if you're trying to make decisions for future generations, how do you make decisions for future generations when systems that you knew were in place for thousands of years are just going AWOL? But, you know, I'm really confident in, in, in our young people, our, our elders are just amazing, our rebel elders are just, you know them really well, Larissa. Um, thanks for, you know, with all your support. So I think it's a combination of um, really sort of handing over to people like Seed Mob and Fire Sticks and, well, you know, Lily and all these really young, amazing people with all the right energy who are going to see new pathways forward um, that we, we can't, can't kind of see as the older generations. There's a lot of your work we could pick up just to um, further that conversation, but obviously you made a quite significant film about that ongoing struggle, um, mm -hmm. Water Shield, Warbitter Bunanu. And I just wondered if you could talk about what you were seeking to convey, because I think it does speak to an uh, intergener multi generational struggle, but also mm -hmm. you know, there's, some, there's some power in there as well. Yeah, no, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, Warbitter Bunanu uh, just basically means water shield. And um, it was sort of on invitation, it came about and thank, thanks to the Indigenous unit of Screen Australia and um, John Harvey who produced it, but it came about um, through a water contamination notice in our, in our community in, in one of the town camps outside of Borolula. So it was the elders were like, man, we need to deal with this. This is the first time we've had a water contamination notice. We've known the water's been contaminated. We're still drinking it because the government and the power company won't, the water company won't do anything about it. So we, we thought, um, I remember the elders going, oh, I remember, you know, like two laws were made in the 70s and it's such a powerful, by Carolyn Strawn and Alexander Covadini. And it was a landmark documentary which partnered with the community and it explored the idea of two laws, you know, white law and Aboriginal law. And it's an it's a absolute beautiful um, two and a half hour <laughs> journey. Um, and so we kind of said, well, we're gonna use that same idea and pay tribute to that lineage of filmmaking in this film. So we kind of also went back to the archive and um, brought up and, 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 and tried to lift up the idea that culture is stronger than contamination. Yeah. So our songs and, um, and our dances bring life to the land. So the continuation of our songs and our song lines and, um, actually bring life to the land. And so I guess that's the crux of it. And Scotty McDenny, my nephew, is an awesome young um, leader. And he was the main character in it. And um, it, was just, it was really cool because all of our relations came into it, like, just randomly. And, you know, um, uh, Wānora flew into the, the shot, which is the white crane, which is my, my mother. And Kanganga, you know, at the end, you know, this beautiful shot came in, sort of showing solidarity and, you know, uh, the the sea eagle came into the shot. So there were a lot of elements that um, bring out that spiritual dimension of life. That's not overt and we don't talk about it all the time, but they're just there. Um, and the film itself is, it did, has had little successes. So one of the things from the film, we believe the film and the campaign helped to build the pipeline from the town to the town camps, which from a filtered water thing. So. So there's little, little wins like that that you've got to celebrate because um, there's so much more to do, I, I guess. Well, the film itself is a celebration of resilience as well. Mm. Um, Jane, your uh, piece in the festival is called Poem for a Dried Up River, so obviously that's going to resonate a lot with what we're talking about today. Um, so I was wondering if you could share what the driving ideas are behind the, the work. Yeah, um, I do want to say, um, so these performances, um, the work was very much co-devised with an amazing artist and sonographer, Elizabeth Gadsby, um, who has created a stunning installation made of clay, um, which I performed the work on. Um, 
It's a, the music is setting a poem by the amazing British poet Alice Oswald, who um, was prompted to write the poem by finding a small figurine of a Roman Britain um, era water nymph in a museum in Gloucestershire. And the poem that she created has this amazing urgency and it's full of, um, of breath and labour. So the music that I've written um, derives a lot of its vocabulary from sounds that, vocal and breath sounds that are the natural consequences of um, physical effort. And um, the depiction of the work on stage is um, that I'm situated among all this beautiful clay and as the water nymph I labour at unrolling this clay into a long riverbed and you know the um, just beautiful thing about clay as a material is that it records a document of every application of weight or gesture to it so at the end of the work we're left with this very heavily marked up uh, riverbed of, of clay that shows all the labour from the outset of the work to the end um, and, and is reminiscent of when you look at a dry riverbed and you, you can see where the last traces of water went. Um, and what we've, you know, the main ideas motivating the work, what, I mean, one thing that was very important to us was to have multiple degrees of scale operating simultaneously. So, you know, on the one hand, the audience is sharing space with me, my one body in the space, working away. Um, but of course, that body can be read as a, an immensely powerful supernatural um, uh, personhood. Um, and then uh, yet another degree of scale is that what this figure is reckoning with is drought, you know, something caused by very large scale climate operations. Um, and, you know, behavioural economists tell us that we have this big problem. Uh, we're just poorly built to kind of understand the magnitude and the timescales of climate change. Um, and I think one of the ways that um, art can potentially sort of reconfigure our thinking is to do what it can do so well by distorting our perception of time or scale. Um, and that's something we've been trying to do in the work. The, the work itself, as you say, is, is quite organic because each performance will, with every nuance, lead to a different, a, a different uh, product at the end of it. But I also wonder over time, we've, you know, we've had drastic changes in the world in the last 12 months and, and, and add to that the, the climate crisis of, of the bushfires. And I was just wondering, as, as a performer and one of the co-creators of the piece, has, it, has its meaning changed for you as the world around you has changed? You know, I, I don't want to sort of um, dishonestly say that it's been really transformed because it, it, the fact is when I was first, I guess I found the poem about three years ago, and when I was first creating the score, I was already <laughs> extremely distressed <laughs> by our sort of disconnection from nature and I still am. <laughs> so um, I would say the thing that feels particularly special about presenting it now is just that you know, through sheer luck and determination and all of these various factors, the festival has actually enabled me to share the space with the audience, which um, that, that's something that, you know, I now appreciate in a way that is quite different from the way I did before. And I guess more broadly, um, as you say, it's uh, um, the, the way we engage with creative practice is shifted enormously through the constraints of the pandemic. But at the same time, uh, the creative arts are a really important way of helping us understand those really big challenges like climate change, but also things that affect us, we can see much more personally like a pandemic when we're isolated. And I was just wondering how you see the role of performing arts and performance as a way of helping people navigate that. Well, I think it, 
the role that the creative arts can play in in enabling a kind of um, particular new ways of understanding the problems that we face and also kind of um, prompting uh, effective action when we, you know, it's very easy to sort of feel there's a lot of hopelessness that sort of pervades these discussions about climate change. And I think the role that the creative arts can play is, is being more and more recognised. Um, and I'm actually part of a small discussion group of people, some, some people are from the University of Pennsylvania, there are some people from the UNFCCC, the United Nations Climate Change um, people. Uh, and my whole role in that group is to bring an artistic perspective to sort of speculating about climate futures and also to sort of exploring um, how imagined futures can be kind of effectively and engagingly communicated. And I just see so much possibility for, you know, I mentioned the way that especially durational art can um, activate new ways of understanding time and, um, and the scale of events. But then I also, just to mention something really specific, I also think there's a real opportunity for um, virtual reality because, you know, with virtual reality installations, you um, have this wholly embodied experience with a novel space where you have to learn how to move in it. You have to kind of learn its contents. And depending on the design of the installation, you can also have a causal role in um, what happens in that imagined environment. Um, so there are sort of all these ways in which we could contribute in an exciting way to really altering the way people perceive what's before us. But I also think, you know, imagining quite utopian futures, um, I mean, possible futures where we actually really coordinate well to address these problems, but then also like completely imaginative, um, impossible in practical terms, futures. I think it's worth encountering those um, spaces imagined by artists to temper the hopelessness that we find, um, especially, you know, with certain data projections <laughs> and, um, and, you know, the negativity that can surround a lot of the discussion. It's a great point and I want to pick up on that with my next question that I want to ask each of you, which is, and go, speaks exactly to the point you're making about how the, the enormity of what we face in terms of the challenge around the climate crisis and the pandemic and the world, the way it's shaped the world, how that if, and how we can actually feel more agency as individuals. So I guess my question to each of you, it's a bit of a double barreled one. Mm -hmm. And one is, you know, what, what is your hope for the future and what do you think that individuals can do? Uh, you know, um, what's your advice when people feel like there's, you know, that a bit hopeless, that there's nothing they can do to, because of the, challenges are so great. And I'll start with you, Janet. Well, my immediate response is um, we're living in it and it's going to go on. Um, it's come about because of our neglect and our not listening to nature. And we, we, we let that happen by disrupting ecosystems, so to speak. But, um, but my immediate thing is that we have to act. And um, I think so many of us have formed activist organisations and things like that because unless we act, I mean, I think acting, um, whatever we do, creates a space of hope because I really feel that we have to keep hope and, and uh, believe that we can work towards something. But if we don't act at all, we, we just resign ourselves to, um, you know, what, what they want to do to us. <laughs> and um, I, I think we can't abide by that. I, I really feel that all these protest groups, everything, it does give us hope that it's from the ground up, there's an enormous noise ra rising. And um, even though it feels incredibly hopeless at times, um, and the and the climate change is so catastrophic that 
that um, at, at times and coming more. And um, and as, as for this virus, is <laughs> and another one um, element of that. So I just believe that we have to be very aware of where we are in on the planet with all the other species and how, you know because everyone everything's coming into play here and and develop our sensitivities to it which as jane says i do believe art can help you find these ways into it you know and uh, i think that yeah we, we just need to be incredibly aware but we need to act yeah great Jason, a vision and what can people do? Um, I, I think, I mean, personally, I feel like we should, you know, listen to our young people more and especially our children. I feel like they're, they kind of live in a different dimension and are much more in tune with, what, with what's happening and they really can feel that anxiety and, um, and that worry that, 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 that we have. Um, so I guess one of those things is to sort of, if we're talking about deep time, um, which was Jane was just mentioning, then if we listen to our children, we can also tune in and uh, as a big believer of education, mm. I feel like education has a huge role to play for our children, growing them up in an education system that is in touch and active with the environment so that they, they will grow into a community and a citizen tr citizenry that will actually say no this is enough you know this is enough is enough all of those policies that are destroying the world all of these mining activities all these extraction activities enough is enough we're going to get rid of those kind of people and moving to a new space where we can really move into a just transition and the just transition to renewables needs to be led and focused on our people as the original custodians of the land and if it's if we're talking about things that need to deal with 200 and so years of destruction, then we need to look at the, the ancient practices that maintained things for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I think if you're an activist or an ally or a witness or um, whatever you want, what sort of role you want to take, it's stepping out of the individual and being collective, being at the protests and putting your body in front of elders, putting your body in front of the elders, looking after the elders and the, the custodians of this knowledge. And, um, and, 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 and moving forward in a way where we're all kind of um, sharing like this. This conversation has been really wonderful um, and intimate because I feel like those are the conversations which help to shift consciousness. And, you know, um, Tony Birch is writing, you know, like the idea of if you don't understand the place you live on, if you don't know your own backyard or where you live, whose country do you live on, then how are you going to understand and have your consciousness shift? So if we want ecological consciousness to shift, which is happening across the world, then we actually need to understand the place, and he writes so eloquently in, in that space. So I guess for me, it's really just comes back down to the family and, um, and, and the community around me and, and moving forward in, in, in a caring um, and humble way on, um, and treating softly and staying positive. Great. And Jane? Went away. Um I'm just going to be reiterating some of the things that Janet and Jason have said. But um, I think it's, re it's really important for us to pay really close attention to the zeitgeist, by which I've just mean, you know, the way that communities are thinking and feeling. Because I sort of perceive, and Jason, this is a bit closely related to what you were saying, I sort of perceive a large scale um, shift in the way that a critical mass of people are sort of taking in information in the West. And I mean, I focus on the West because very reasonably, uh, a lot of the responsibility of addressing climate change falls to us. Um, but I feel like there's a critical mass of people who are um, finding new ways to, like in the West, we have this habit of taking in information kind of primarily through the intellect and then the responses that have been recently desirable are sort of um, ones presented in highly rational terms. And it seems to me that um, a lot of young people in particular are 
registering current events, you know, COVID, also climate change, also various large scale political shifts, registering these through a kind of multimodal way of taking in information where, you know, equally um, they're taking it in through the intellect, but also um, through the emotions and through the body. And I feel like the expressive gestures that result um, are also inflected with this multidimensionality in a way that, you know, it's quite chaotic at the moment, that, that energy. Um, I find it incredibly beautiful. Maybe that's by the by, but I, I think it's something we should pay really close attention to because, you know, I mentioned earlier this fact, we've all been mentioning that we seem ill-equipped to, to kind of reckon with the magnitude of the problem. And I wonder if the large scale uptake of this other way of being might actually be a crucial tool in altering those modes of thought. Thank you. Well, my final question uh, is going back to the personal and the individual. And all of us have been affected by the pandemic in a range of ways, how we live, how, how we work. And I was just wondering if you could share with us, each of you, something that you've learned about yourself during this time, this extraordinary time. And I'll start with you, Jane. Well, I have to say, I'm mildly embarrassed to answer this question because I really have not suffered the hardships that so many people have suffered. Um, but one thing I would say is, you know, I've learnt that to live quietly and slowly is good for me, and I sort of suspect it might be good for other people too. Um, and, you know, I was one of these people who at the outset of uh, the pandemic, I had these very utopian ideas about how it's an opportunity to transform society. We can, um, you know, people ha we can just fix all these crappy bits, like people being stuck in traffic, poor people being constantly dehumanised and denied effective resources, um, people not being able to control their working hours, all these things. Um, and I feel we've kind of missed the opportunity to correct a lot of that. But that if we're to correct course, um, young people, are, like there is this tidal wave of talent that I think is somewhat being held back by a sort of generation of gatekeepers. Uh, and if, if some space is, is freed up, um, like Gen Z are gonna save us, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Well, there's some hope there. What there's about some you? hope. <laughs> what about you, Jason? What have you learned um, about yourself? I think I was a little bit addicted to social media. So it's been actually really nice to step away from that a lot. But I did see a really great um, joke from Uncle Ken Canning, Buddha Gagucha, who helped set up Jambana in the Aboriginal space here with Aunty Francis. And, um, and it was like, oh, last, last time I stole a calendar, I, lost, I, I got 12 months you know, he got 12 months in jail, you know, like he's an ex. And I thought it was, um, it was really poignant because I, I feel like I kind of gained some time with my family and took time out of the rat race to, to sit in the garden, to get an organic seed, to plant the seed with the kids and my partner who's been teaching me about gardening and to watch that grow into a tomato or something and then the kids to pick it and eat it. You know, a three-year-old going through that conscious, you know, that, and that's where that shift is happening. And it makes me feel really good knowing that that's where we're at. With, if growth and renewal was going to happen in Australia, I feel like our backyard is a really, really healthy place to begin that journey together. And Janet? It's quite strange because I, was, uh, I went to Taiwan just as we were about to go into lockdown here and everyone was saying, you're mad and, you know, and I went and I had three weeks there and I was in the country and of course they hadn't been affected at all and life was normal and um, I had this, you know, this very special time in, in a particular environment there. And somehow I got very prepared for a way of, of imagining it could be dealt with as they dealt with it. And I came back and I had to go into quarantine, but I by one day missed the hotel, thank God. And I was able to be in Patonga 
up in Patonga by the water and I had this gorgeous time and I'm thinking, what's everyone worrying about? This is like, anyway, look, I have to, like Jane, confess that I have personally not suffered um, because I've con been able to continue to do my work. And in fact, a lot's been happening, you know, in art and things and, and even internationally, you know, it's very weird. I can't go, but work can go and things like that. So, um, but at the same time, um, observing it more closely, I realise um, this, this um, terrible, um, um, the, the, um, the crashing um, controls that they've put on us really worry me and that they know they can do that. They know they can, and, and that really worries me into the future. Also, you know, what they already did with some of the, the climate protests, they used it to stop those. And I worry how they will u continue to use this, um, this control. But the other thing is that I really feel, I'm, I don't panic though. I, I'm, I, I mean, I see a lot of people around me really panicking and reading all the, the figures every day. And I find that I'm able to just say, look, it's just part of our life and it's going to go on. And, um, and, and so that gives me a kind of peace and I can, you know, go on with my life. I mean, my garden is always like my therapy. I, I garden the whole foreshore land, which is a lot of, a lot of gardening to be done, but it speaks to me and, and tells me, hey, we're doing fine at the mm -hmm. moment. And so, um, yeah, so I've realised that and I've realised I can go on with my work and, and there is a real reason to be continuing to work in this way. And so I might be totally deluded, but um, it, it enables me to keep working. Well, I think we can all take hope from the fact that whatever happens, art continues. Yes. Now, if we had a live audience, this is the point at which you would be getting a rapturous round of applause and a big thank you for sharing your insights and thoughts. Um, Janet Lawrence, Jason DeSantelo and Jane Sheldon, it was such a pleasure to listen to your thoughts and ideas. Um, I just want to let people know that Requiem, which is curated by Janet Lawrence, is at the Paddington Reservoir Gardens from the 16th to the 24th of January. And you can look on the Sydney Festival website for the lists of talks and workshops um, associated with that. Poem for a Dried Up River was at Carriage Works from the 6th to the 10th of January, but you can follow Jane Sheldon's work at her website, Jane Sheldon Soprano, as one word, dot com. And you can find out about Jason DeSantelo's film, um, Water Shield, uh, Warbita Bunanu, and the community and the issues it focuses on at the website, Water Shield Film, as one word, dot com. This forum was brought to you by Sydney Festival and UTS, the proud knowledge partner of the festival, and it's being recorded for the ABC for an upcoming episode of Speaking Out. So thank you so much for joining us.